So when I was 26 years old, I boarded an unmarked plane on a secret one way in the dead of night and found myself surrounded by a plane load of big, brawny, gun-toting men. I spent the next few thousand miles of this plane ride trying to play it cool, probably failing miserably. And when the plane finally landed, all I could see outside was the pitch black expanse of tarmac and a few floodlit vehicles. When the plane doors opened, I was quickly shunted into a van with blacked out windows, thrown a bulletproof vest, and told to buckle up for what would probably be a very bumpy ride. I was terrified. I was totally out of my element. I was overwhelmed by the unknown, and I was very, very alone. I had just landed in an active war zone. I spent the next eight months of my life trying to get comfortable with the many discomforts I faced in this war zone. I had to pee in buckets. I slept in storage containers. I had to wear a flak jacket every day, carried weapons, sometimes two. And I got lots of curious glances from pretty much everyone around me. The locals, fellow Westerners, didn't really know what to do with me. I was very, very unexpected, and I sort of confused and surprised them. But I was in my element. I was comfortable, and I was confident, and I could have happily stayed for many, many more months in an active war zone halfway around the world. Now, let's rewind about 13 years before that. I'm 13 years old. I'm a freshman in high school and I'm at a residential soccer camp in New Jersey with a few fellow soccer teammates and a few hundred other kids. And I'm on the phone begging my mom to let me come home early. I am terrified, I am alone, and I'm totally overwhelmed by what's in front of me at soccer camp in New Jersey. Now, let's rewind a few years before that. I am in the car this time with my poor mom, desperately asking her for advice on how I can be more popular at school. I am a young brown girl from a Hindu family in a mostly white Catholic school, and I feel like such an outsider. My mom says, just be yourself. And my six-year-old self knows intuitively what bad advice that is. And I say, but that's not working. And the two of us pass the rest of that car ride, pretty much an exasperated silence. Because for most of my young life, I was a shy, self-conscious, awkward homebody who really felt like a weirdo. I was called a weirdo. I was called a dot head. I was pigeonholed as a nerd, and I was never one of the cool kids. I was so aware of all of the ways I didn't fit in. Fitting in didn't really feel possible for me. I wasn't fully any one thing that could be folded into a nice, neat little square. I was American and Indian. I was a book-loving nerd, still am, and a soccer-loving athlete. I was competitive, hyper-alpha female in many ways, but I was also an empathetic team player. I was lots and lots of seemingly divergent things, and it made me feel chaotic. And because I felt chaotic, I tried my best to harmonize the world around me, to bring order to the chaos. As an outsider, I think I sometimes saw what the insiders didn't. Being shy and self-conscious made me keenly aware of other people's emotions. And not talking all the time really trained me to hear and to see and to pay attention when everyone around me was making noise. So how did this weird, introverted, chaotic feeling girl from Staten Island end up at the Central Intelligence Agency, one of the most elite intelligence organizations in the world? Well, let's start with what didn't happen. 
I didn't have one of those 80s rom-com style makeovers where I went from ugly duckling to beautiful swan with you know, some contact lenses and a few wardrobe upgrades and a really cool soundtrack. I didn't have an epiphany moment where I became suddenly confident and joined the ranks of the popular kids. I didn't downplay my bookishness so that the world or the CIA would think I was cool. And I didn't start drinking martinis until much later in life. And the other thing that didn't happen is I never stopped feeling awkward. I never stopped feeling like too many Venn diagrams smashing up against each other. I didn't stop feeling homesick when I took myself away for months at a time, first to Costa Rica, then to Oman and to Italy, even before I joined the CIA. It didn't stop any of that. So what did get me into the CIA? What made them want to give me that proverbial tap on the shoulder? And I hate to admit it because it means my mom was kind of right, but the CIA wanted me because of what I saw as my greatest weakness, my weirdness, my non-fittingness. You see, all that stuff that I did when I was a kid to try to harmonize the world and bring order to chaos, all of that being sensitive to others' emotions and seeing and hearing and paying attention when everyone else around me was making noise, all that stuff I did because I didn't fit, all that stuff made me attractive to the agency. My weirdness, it turned out, was my power. And it stayed my power at the CIA because in many ways it was the power at the CIA, perhaps our superpower. We were the weirdos who didn't obsess over hierarchy. We would send 20-somethings into the Oval Office to brief the president. We shared our glory instead of hoarding it. When we were at our best, we were a flat organization that valued competence over seniority. We were weird that way, wired that way. We didn't worry about standard operating procedures because we knew from hard-won experience that nothing in the world is standard. No mission, no objective, no target, nothing. We as individuals were never standard. So we saw the world for all of its chaos and complexity, and we loved to play within it as it was. Our ragtag group of weirdos, we didn't run from failure or from mess. We embraced it as a natural part of life. And so while other organizations were obsessing over chain of command or SOPs or the done thing, we were out there getting the job done. And this made us weird. Not perfect in any way, of course. We struggled, we got things wrong, we messed up, sometimes spectacularly. But because we struggled and got things wrong and messed up spectacularly, we developed what I like to call an enlightened swagger. The swagger came from the skills and the training and all of the successes, all of those brilliant things that we got done behind the scenes and couldn't brag about because they were classified. And the enlightenment that came from knowing the world can be a messy place, that it's impossible to know everything or to confidently predict anything. So to tone it down a bit, because the world would always surprise you. Surprise you, perhaps, like an uncertain six-year-old becoming a CIA operative, or a Navy SEAL quoting Dostoevsky, or a security detail full of big, brawny men grappling with eating disorders, or an Ivy League brainiac becoming an elite bomb technician. Surprises, all of us, me and my friends in that faraway war zone, we were ever-surprising people operating in ever-surprising circumstances, going to battle, sometimes with enemies, sometimes with bureaucracy or politics, but always knowing that even if we didn't win, we were the only ones who would decide when we were done fighting. So perhaps my greatest surprise at joining the CIA wasn't that I had joined it, but that so many other so-called weirdos had joined it too. And that what I once thought of as my great weakness was mine and the CIA's greatest strength. Because being surprising, being unexpected and a bit different, being a bit weird, it allows you to go in and stand out and do things in ways that fitting in never could. 
It allows you to defy expectations, to defy boxes, and to create new, often better rules for how things are done. When I was in that war zone as a 26-year-old, I got off of another plane, this time on a remote special forces base in the middle of nowhere. And it was just me, my station chief, and one other agency officer. And I could see the shock on the faces of those SF guys who lined up to shake our hands. One of them actually said, you're not the geek we were expecting. But being an unexpected geek, being the geek who took on the commanding general, being the unexpected geek who battled presidents and prime ministers intellectually, being the unexpected geek who shared bench seats with foreign leaders and huddled under sandbags, being that unexpected geek, it made me memorable. And it allowed me to create new rules for what so-called geeks could do. My time at the CIA showed me the power of not fitting in, of being unchained to convention and redefining what people like us can do when we operate in the non-binary gray when we embrace the weird and own the surprising. And I guess one of the most important things I learned about being a CIA operative is that this is true about life overall. That many of us, maybe all of us, are not fully one thing or another. And that we are all weird and surprising in some way. And this makes us powerful. Where fitting in was once necessary for basic survival or for success in corporate life, the world is changing. My work at the CIA and the work I do now with organizations around the world is showing me that we have started to move on from blind acceptance of SOPs and the done thing and best practice, and that we are recognizing that the highest performers, the most agile organizations, the most vibrant societies, and the most coherent societies are the ones that leverage the power of not conforming. We don't need role models or archetypes, because the reality is we don't need to see it to be it. We can all be it so that others can see it. When we uncover the hidden parts of ourselves, when we stop telling ourselves all of the things that we are or that we're not. So do you, is I guess what I'm trying to say here. Be your weird self. Be surprising. Let yourself surprise yourself when you stop boxing yourself in and when you develop your own enlightened swagger. No drama, no angst, no being in other people's faces about it or forcing it or making it a big deal. Just being you. Showing yourself that even you, no matter where you are now, it does not have to determine where you go next that even if you were an uncertain shy six-year-old or an awkward teen or the brown girl in Catholic school, even you can go on to be a CIA operative and surprise yourself, even you. Because the world is moving our way, you guys. Today, organizations everywhere are doing things differently, breaking the rules and embracing diversity in all of its forms. And not as some bland PR exercise and a tick the box exercise, but in recognition of the fact that the world is a diverse place. Of course it is. So of course the workplace should reflect that. There are no shortage of examples, especially in tech, you know, where the rule is to move fast and break things. But even in a place like the CIA that's bound by tradition and shrouded in secrecy, even in a place like that, the change is happening. It always was in a way. Because the CIA used to be a place full of generals and military men, and then it evolved into a proving ground for well-bred gentlemen who went to Yale, or wholesome farm boys from Virginia who had nasty crew cuts and wore really tight-fitting suits. That's an allusion to the Mission Impossible films in case anyone hasn't seen those movies. But because the CIA aspires to be the very best intelligence organization in the world, it already has started embracing weirdos like me. My sincere belief is that this is the new norm, that the world is going this way, and that any organization hoping to be the best at what they do is taking this approach. So I guess what I'm really trying to say here is, there's hope for us yet. All of us, not really that weird after all weirdos, 
and that the world is changing. We have changed it, and we can keep changing it by being who we are. Now, the main drawback, of course, of taking this approach is admitting that my mom was right all along, and that her advice to just be yourself was powerful and profound, not at all stupid, and not at all simple. So I guess what I'm finally trying to say is, thanks, Mom. You were right. And thanks to all of you. Thank you.